other person uh, from the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the University of Alberta. And uh, his topic is absorption of the dynamics of sulfur and nitrogen containing compounds on nickel nicotinum sulfide chemistry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to take the time to acknowledge my co-authors on this paper. The first one is Dr. Mingyong Sun, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my research laboratory. Um, I'm pleased to say that Mingyong just recently accepted a position at Sioux Chemi in Kentucky. So due to obvious reasons, he cannot be here today to deliver his presentation. So I'll do my best to give his work justice. But I should point out that he is responsible for all the calculations and simulations that I'll be able to present and share with you today. The second is John and Jay in Simcrude Canada Limited, not only for the collaboration in regards to pursuing this research project, but as well in terms of providing the financial support in collaboration with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Catalytic hydrotreating and the absorption of organosulfur and organonitrogen compounds on nickel molysulfide catalyst surfaces need very little in the way of introduction, particularly in light of some of the earlier presentations today. So I'll just make a couple of introductory remarks and then move right on into the methodology and results. Our motivation for this study was to begin to understand the salient features of those mutual inhibitory effects between organosulfur and organonitrogen compounds on the well-defined nickel molysulfide edge surface. The only thing that I would add to some of the previous uh, discussions and comments that were made in terms of the background information is that it's previously, previously been reported that one of the key limiting factors, if not the key limiting factor, preventing the complete desulfurization of 460 MDBT is the presence of basic nitrogen species in the feedstock. So we need to be concerned with the, the competition between nitrogen and sulfur compounds on the active sites and begin to understand is this purely a thermodynamic phenomenon being one of just simple absorption or is there more to this phenomenon? We in this, in undertaking this research objective, use computational chemistry to help understand what the absorption thermodynamics and what the bonding modes look like on these edge points of nickel molysulfide surfaces. The primary reason for this is we can develop a well-defined edge surface or in other words, we have complete control over what the active sites look like. So if we were to do this experimentally, it would be difficult, if not possible, to separate out the effects of the aluminum support and the edge planes that we have here in the Kamali sulfide catalyst surfaces. So in the case of DFT, we can come in and we can create representative models of what a fully promoted Nicomali sulfide edge surface looks like. And I have two models that are presented here on this slide. Model A is what we call a two nickel model, where you can see in that each unit cell we have exposed two nickel edge atoms. And in model B, we have six nickel edge atoms that are exposed. Because we apply a periodic boundary condition to both of these models and all of our calculations, we essentially have the same surface in both cases. The only reason that we'd use the two nickel model, of course, is for computational efficiencies. One thing that we have to be aware of, however, is that if we want to use this smaller model, because we have a periodic boundary condition, these neighboring adsorbates may see each other and there may be some false interaction between these adsorbates. In other words, it may skew the adsorption energetics that you calculate for a single molecule on these edge surfaces. So what we're able to do is that for light compounds, for example, hydrogen, H2S, ammonia, for thiophene, or, sorry, for the top three molecules up here, hydrogen, H2S, and ammonia, we're able to use the two nickel model. When we start to get the larger compounds like thiophene, parole, aniline, and, and pyridine, we need to use the larger six molybdenum model to prevent those interactions. 
Now what I've shown or summarized here is just a summary of the most active, or sorry, the most stable adsorption geometries. How did we arrive at these adsorption geometries? Well, I'll just show you a couple of slides to kind of illustrate this process. Initially, what we have to do is test a variety of initial geometries, let DFT do its thing, so to speak, and figure out what the most stable geometry is. So for example, in the case of pyridine, we can orient pyridine parallel to the surface. And in this case, we center pyridine directly above the nickel atom. So you see the nickel atom is right here in between this pyridine ring. If we allow DFT to do its thing and we calculate the stable absorption geometry, what we see is that given this initial configuration, pyridine is not stable. It desorbs back from the surface and has a very weak interaction energy with that surface, certainly in the regime of physical absorption. However, if we just take our initial geometry and change it ever so slightly, such that we put this nickel atom directly uh, below our nitrogen atom in our pyridine structure, now what we see is what happens is when we do the geometry optimization, in fact, we get a stable geometry through the single orbital of the nitrogen atom, and we get essentially an A to 1 configuration, one that's bound very strongly to the surface. So in that, again, in that previous slide, we did a similar approach to identify the optimal geometries for all these systems. With the use of DFT, we can also uh, conduct some experiments, if you will, that you can't do in the physical world. So for example, if you want to understand how carbazole interacts with these edge planes, you can bring carbazole down on the edge surface. And if you calculate the stable absorption geometry given this initial configuration, you'll see it's a fairly moderate absorption energy, 52 kilojoules per mole. Probably the most interesting thing with the stable absorption geometry is, of course, the fact that these benzene rings deform, or they're bent out of plane of that carbazole backbone structure, which would indicate that the primary area of interaction is not that metal pyrrolic ring, it's in fact the two end benzene rings. How can we confirm this? Well, again, this is one of the benefits of DFT. We can just take this molecule and rotate it 90 degrees. Now, in the physical world, of course, we can't do this. But again, in the calculation world, we can confirm that in fact this is the case. And if we do this calculation, we see that carbazole tends to desorb back from the surface and again has a much lower absorption energy. So in addition to just calculating stable bonding energies and the actual absorption energies, we can begin to understand what areas within these molecules are most strongly interacting with that catalyst surface. Now, in order to do the, the complete or the rigorous approach to understanding the thermodynamics of absorption, we need to apply a little bit of thermodynamics here. In all of our calculations, we just do a simple uh, material or energy balance where we're just calculating the difference between the adsorbed state and then the clean surface and the free molecule. I'm not going to go through any of these equations that I'll show in, in great detail, other than to say is that we're going through and we're correcting all the ground state energetics that you calculate with DFT or temperature, but the temperature correction involves a zero point vibrational energy term as well as a heat capacity term. Quite often, this zero point vibrational energy is neglected in doing thermodynamic calculations based on DFT, but what I'll show you in just a minute is that this is a very important term, and if you neglect this, you can actually generate considerable errors. The other terms that are commonly neglected is the entropy term, whereby we, we normally assume that the entropy loss upon absorption is 100%. Again, what I'll show you in a little bit is you can't always do that, it's particularly for larger molecules, so we have to be concerned with this entropy term. What do some of these numbers look like for several representative compounds that we might find in a hydrotreater? Well, what I've got here is, is several light compounds, H2, H2S, ammonia, and so forth. We've calculated the change in ground state energies, and it's delta E in kilojoules per mole for these systems. And what you can see based on these numbers is that basic nitrogen species interact more strongly with the surface of that nickel moly sulfide catalyst. Again, what you'll see is that the change in zero point vibrational energy upon absorption is significant for many of these molecules whereby if we neglect this, it's going to cause significant errors in the subsequent thermodynamic calculations. We can also go in and calculate heat capacities for several, or for all of our molecules. Again, I'm not going to go through these equations in detail. Hopefully, several of them are familiar to you. Um, in the next slide, we'll show how we calculate the entropy uh, for our different species as well. Again, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but just to say that it's, it's a bit of a rigorous approach so you can start to understand why some people would tend to neglect this uh, in terms of their calculation. So what do these numbers look like if we apply this approach to gas-based species? Well, we've calculated heat capacities and entropies 
at two different temperatures, 525 and 650 Kelvin, for the different molecules that we've already introduced. And what you can see is essentially a range of temperature effects. For example, in terms of heat capacity, hydrogen is relatively insensitive. Aniline porous has a, has a fairly large temperature dependency. And you can see the, the entropies as well for these different molecules. You can pick out an entropy, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, talking about the entropy loss upon absorption. The next question for us was to ask, how well did these predictions agree with the experiment? After all, it's fairly straightforward to go into the laboratory and measure heat capacities. And in fact, you may say, why are we even going to this length to, to estimate heat capacities when we can just go to the laboratory and measure them directly? Hold on to that last thought, because I'll come, on, I'll, I'll come to that in the later part of my talk. This presents heat capacities, so heat capacities on the y-axis as a function of temperature for the molecules of interest. And what you can see is that over a broad temperature range, our calculated heat capacities agree very well with experimental data. Certainly for the lighter compounds, we get better agreement. For aniline, we have, I guess, the largest error in terms of heat capacities, but even the largest error is only about 4% of the value. So we can calculate with reasonable accuracy the heat capacities for these different molecules. If we look at calculating the remainder of the thermodynamic properties, that is delta H, delta S, and delta G for the adsorbed state. Again, we did this at two different temperatures, 525 and 650 Kelvin. And what you can see is that, again, in terms of delta H, basic nitrogen species interact more strongly with that catalyst surface. If I was able to flip back, and I, I won't drag you through that, but if I was able to flip back and go into those entropy calculations that I showed you earlier, what you would see is that the entropy loss upon absorption for some of these light compounds, like hydrogen or hydrogen sulfide, is about 75%. So if you neglected entropy loss upon absorption, you wouldn't be too far off in your calculations. But if you did that for a compound like aniline, where the entropy loss is only about 60%, you're going to introduce significant so it's best to take the rigorous approach, although it's a little bit more work up front, it will give you better thermodynamic data in this sense. Taking that delta G value then, we can calculate the equilibrium constant, uh, the absorption equilibrium constant for our different species. So I've just got a simple bad top plot here where I've got the natural log of K. It's a function of 1 over temperature for our different species. A couple of key things to walk away with in terms of this graph. Nitrogen compounds being ammonia, purity, and paneling, particularly the basic nitrogen species, higher absorption equilibrium constants than any of the other molecules that we looked at as part of the study. What that would tell you then is that nitrogen species are going to dominate those edge planes under typical hydrotreating conditions. One other interesting aspect of this graph is that hydrogen is relatively insensitive to the equilibrium constant for hydrogen, is relatively insensitive to temperature. So what this would say is that over a broad temperature range, you're going to have very similar absolute hydrogen carbon. However, if you wanted to start mitigating the effects of nitrogen deactivation, simple site blocking, you could operate at higher temperatures, whereby you increase the relative coverage of hydrogen compared to the nitrogen-containing species. So just to kind of wrap up in terms of text, what I've, what I've just summarized in a previous graph, in doing these thermodynamic calculations, taking into consideration zero-point vibrational entropy or zero-point vibrational energy and entropy are, are critical to generate accurate thermodynamics data, and from these data we can predict that nit basic nitrogen species are always going to dominate that catalyst surface under normal hydrotreating conditions. We can play around with temperature here a little bit to help mitigate those effects, but still at the end of the day, nitrogen compounds are going to have a higher torsion equilibrium constant than the other species that we looked at. So where do we go from here? So in the last uh, little bit, I'm just going to share with you some work that's in progress. And that's taking this to the next level to apply this methodology, to apply this approach to compounds that are more relevant to heavy oil. So again, it's understanding the thermodynamics of some polynuclear aromatics, and it's also understanding and resolving the structure of asphalt heat. And this is where the limitation of experiment and the, the arrival, if you will, of DFT start to come into play. So if you didn't believe, or if you don't believe me, that we're able to predict heat capacities and thermodynamic quantities for all molecules, I went in and, and repeated that analysis for a little bit larger hydrocarbon being tetracene here. And I'll show you that data on the next slide. So what I've plotted out here is our calculated versus experimental data for the heat capacity for tetracene. Again, I've got on the y-axis my heat capacities, and on the x-axis I have my temperature. The red triangles here are experimental data. Solid line here is a previous, uh, uh, previously reported heat capacity data based on calculations. 
And the dashed lines multiple out here are our calculated heat capacities based on several different exchange correlation functionals within DFT. So what you can see is, is firstly, the accuracy of or the ability to predict heat capacity is fairly insensitive to which exchange correlation function that you use. And again, if you use this rigorous approach, you get fairly good agreement between predicted and experimental heat capacities. Now, how can we use this to our benefit? Well, we can use this to help resolve what the structure is of heavy gas or heavy oil asphaltines. You've seen a couple of structural representations of asphaltines earlier today. These are just two additional models. All structures of asphaltines can be generally categorized into two key groups. The first is what we call an archipelago type of model. That one is shown here on the left, whereby all the aromatic rings and aromatic structures are connected together with a linear carbon framework. The other one is what we call a peri-condensed model, where we have these large platelets of aromatic structures. Now we can go to the laboratory and we can measure heat capacities, for example, for these compounds. We can use NMR to determine the aromatic and aliphatic carbon content, but the structure of asphaltines is still a great debate in the open literature. So one of the things that we can do is we can model both of these compounds, we can predict the thermodynamic quantities, and see which of the two structures agree better with the experimental properties. Now, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to wrap up this picture today. Um, the calculations on these molecules take about six months to converge. So what I was able to do is I was able to actually predict the heat capacity for this, the first compound that I have here. So it's by no means uh, all inclusive, but it does give you a sense as to what we can do. So if I calculate the heat capacity of this archipelago model, Pair that with heat capacity data for Athabasca bitumen vacuum bottoms. Again, heat capacity is a function of temperature. The blue triangles are the blue diamonds here. These are experimental values. And the red line is what I'm able to calculate based on density functional theory. And what we can see is that pulling the phase transitions aside, we get fairly good agreement between experimental and theoretical heat capacities. Now, this doesn't exclude the peri-condensed model at this point, but that is something that's currently running, and if you, if you have a real interest on this, just see me afterwards, and I'll be more than happy to send you an email, hopefully about a month, with the rest of the data, and hopefully wrap this picture up. So, I see that I'm, a, I'm running short on time here, so maybe what I'll do is I'll just leave this slide up to capture some of the implications of resolving the structures of heavy oil molecules and asphaltines, and maybe just turn things over for questions. So, with that. Very nice work, Alan. Thank you. Question. I saw that the uh, aniline is having a stronger uh, delta H yes. than the pyridine. However, the adsorption constant, so the delta G, was the reverse. So it's in the entropy. It's in the entropy term. And uh, we all know that the pyridine is stronger than the aniline, and your, but your, your delta H doesn't show that. So why is the entropy switching it? Uh, that, that's a good question, and I can't, I can't give you a direct answer because I, honestly, I don't know. What we know is that the entropy loss upon adsorption for aniline is, is, is the lowest of all the molecules that we look at. It's only about 60%, where even pyridine is, is higher than that. So it is wrapped up in the entropy. Because there's still rotation? I, I Presumably, that there's still some rotation that's involved in the adsorbed state. But uh, you know, other than some speculation, I, I really don't know, and I can't really comment on it. Because it changes our whole picture, yeah. of, of, uh, because everybody knows that, the, let's say, the pyridine would that looks stronger and the That's right. is a weak one. That's right. Because in the coal tar, you know that as an intermediate, it is just a holder product That's until right. finally the others are gone and That's then right. the enzymes can go. That's right. So it's very important to understand it. That's right. Hi, Alan. Have you done any adsorption experiment with commercial copper moly catalyst to get the adsorption coefficient? compared to your calculation, see what's the difference. The question was is whether or not we've done any experimental or any experimental work looking at calculating um, the or actually measuring the adsorption equilibrium constant using commercial catalysts. The answer to that question is, is no. Uh, the primary reason is, is that we do that work, we know that the substrate, maybe alumina, has inherent acidity as well. So when you back out the adsorption equilibrium constant, it's almost impossible to deconvolute the adsorption equilibrium constant for the active phases and the support materials. 
So that was essentially the, the motivation for using the computational approach that we used. At low temperatures. predicting the heat capacity. The question is, is there's, there seems to be some uh, deviation at lower temperatures yeah. down below 100 K. Yeah. And, and I agree. The origin of this, I, I tend to argue, um, is actually comes back to the approach of using zero point vibrational energy. Yeah. Because what we're assuming or what we're, what we're using in terms of the zero point vibrational energy is the fact that the energy of the molecule is not zero. So we're going to have some non-zero heat capacity at zero Kelvin. And so it's, although it allows us to predict higher temperature heat capacities, certainly at the lower temperatures taking this approach, we can't predict heat capacities at 